Thank you very much for the introduction, Teresa. Um, so hopefully everyone can hear me okay. If you can't, please just put a little note um, in the chat window there. Um, so I'm here to just give a very quick um, overview and introduction to the OER16 Open Culture Conference. Um, the event is taking place at the University of Edinburgh here in Scotland. Um, this is the seventh um, OER conference, but it's the very first time that it's come to Scotland, so we're very pleased to be welcoming it to Edinburgh. Um, and I'm going to actually just, I was hoping that I would be able to show you a bit of Edinburgh here today, um, but I've got some light problems in the office, but if I turn my laptop around, hopefully you should be able to see Edinburgh Castle in the background. Um, so not quite the venue for the conference, but it's not far away either. Um, so the theme of the conference, which is taking place on the 19th and 20th of April, um, is the value proposition of embedding open culture in the context of institutional strategies. Um, and I'm very honoured to be co-chairing the conference um, with Melissa Hyten, um, who is the Director of Learning, Teaching and Web Services here at the University. And Melissa has been behind um, many of the open education initiatives that have been taking place at the university over the last 12 months, including not just hosting OER16, um, but also launching a portal for open educational resources uh, and approving a new OER policy for the University of Edinburgh. Um, and that policy is based on the Leeds OER policy, which has also been adopted by Glasgow Caledonian University and the University of Greenwich. So it's really nice to see this policy propagating across different institutions. So the main themes of the OER 16 Open Culture Conference um, are the strategic advantage of open and how we can create a culture of openness um, and avoid the reputational challenges of open washing. We've deliberately not defined exactly what we mean by a culture of openness. You can interpret that as and how you will. It could be about a culture of openness within your institution, or it could be about openness within cultural heritage institutions. We also want to focus on converging and competing cultures of openness, open knowledge, open source, open content, open practice, open data, uh, because I think in the past, um, some of these um, cultures and communities, although they are very open within themselves, they are still a bit siloed. So we really want to start bringing some of those together. We also have a strand on hacking, making and sharing, which I know is um, a very sort of popular and um, current issue within many institutions at the moment. Um, and also openness and public engagement. But one of the main themes of the conference is going to be what we can do to um, foster innovative approaches to opening up cultural heritage collections for um, education. And we made real efforts to reach out to cultural heritage institutions across the UK to encourage them to participate in the conference. And we're very, very pleased um, that many, um, many of our cultural heritage institutions have actually um, uh, submitted that proposals and will be taking part in the conference um, from the library sector and from the museum sector. So we're really pleased with the response there. We did get a, a fabulous response to the conference. I think we had over 130 um, submissions altogether. Uh, and out of those, we have accepted 101 papers from 29 countries throughout the world. Um, so we're really, really encouraged to have um, such a global spread um, of papers. Um, the OER conferences have, they've never really pushed themselves as being international conferences as such, but over the years, international participation has really grown. Um, and again, we were very encouraged to have a great deal of international participation in the conference committee this year as well. Um, so I'd like to say a huge thanks to all those who have helped to get the conference as far as it has already. Um, we're also very aware of um, the gender balance of papers, and I'm sure some of you will be familiar with the, um, the all-male panels meme um, that has been going around on Twitter and Tumblr, and hopefully we will be, um, there will be no all-male panels at um, OER16, I hope. And in actual fact, um, of all the submissions that we received, um, of those um, people who indicated their gender, we actually had pretty much a 50-50 split, so we're really pleased with that. 
Um, we also have a very diverse um, group of keynotes um, at the conference this year, which we hope will reflect the diversity of the programme and the themes of the conference. Um, clearly, we're very lucky to have Catherine Cronin here with us today, and she'll be um, speaking about some of the themes that she'll be exploring as part of our keynote. Um, but we're also very honoured to have um, four other um, amazing keynote speakers. Um, Emma Smith from the University of Oxford um, will be talking about um, a wide range of open education initiatives she's been involved with. Um, Emma is a professor of Shakespeare studies at the University of Oxford um, and she's been involved in open education initiatives for many, many years. We'll also have uh, John Scally, who is the National Librarian of Scotland here in Edinburgh. Um, the National Library here have recently published a new strategy um, which is very much focused um, on uh, increasing access um, to the Institute, to the, the, the National Library's collections. Um, and while clearly going you know, fully behind an opening licensing, everything is um, perhaps not an option at this point in time, um, the Library is certainly making real moves to making sure its collections are accessible to all. We're also going to be very pleased to welcome Jim Groom to the conference. Um, I know that many of you will know Jim from his work with um, the DS106 uh, MOOC. Um, and Jim has also now been working with um, Reclaim Hosting, um, which I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about as part of the conference. And our final keynote of the conference um, is Melissa Highton, my co-chair. And she'll be talking about um, open initiatives here at the University of Edinburgh and what it means to be um, an open institution. So we've got a really diverse um, group of keynote speakers here. Um, the conference itself will be taking place at the John McIntyre Conference Centre within the university, that's in the, the Pollock campus, um, which is a short bus ride or uh, about a 20 minute walk away from the main part of the university. Um, and the conference dinner will take place at TV at Row House, um, which is also the student union of the university. Um, and we'll also be um, having a social programme which will hopefully um, encourage people to learn more um, about um, the university and the city of Edinburgh. And of course, there are lots of nice attractions here as well, like that castle out the window there. So please do, if you haven't already, register for the conference. Um, unfortunately, early bird registration has now passed. It closed on the 6th of the month. Um, however, people who are members of ALT um, or members of the conference committee are still able to register at the reduced rate. Um, and we will keep registration open um, right up until um, the very last minute. So there is plenty of time to register. Um, of course, we would very much encourage people to come to Edinburgh, but if you're unable to actually get to the conference in person, there will be many options um, for participating remotely. All the keynotes will be streamed. Um, Radio Edutalk will be around to do interviews from the presenters, um, and we will also have various social media channels um, which you'll be able to follow. Uh, we'll have people tweeting and live blogging. So there'll be lots of options to participate remotely. So um, that's really my brief overview. Uh, like I said, save the date. If you haven't registered, uh, please do. Yes, Virtually Connect will be there as well, Viv. So thanks for mentioning that. Um, so please do register if you haven't. And if you can't come along in person, then I hope we will be able to see you participating remotely. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lorna. It's so exciting seeing this conference coming together and, and uh, seeing the tweets going round. And also, we've had meetings around uh, um, finding funding for people who needed support in order to attend the conference. Really good to know, because Lorna and I and, uh, and several others were involved in um, making sure that funding support was available um, for those who couldn't get funding. And great to know that we've got about £4,000 coming from ALT to support people um, so that they can attend and they can present. And I'm sure it will be absolutely brilliant. I'm totally gutted that I can't be there physically, but I will absolutely be following the live stream and, um, and following on Twitter and interacting everywhere I can. So thank you very much, Lorna. I know Edinburgh is a fabulous place to come to, and I'm sure everybody's going to have a, just a great time. Now, we've had a, a, a great week, and OER16 is a, is, a, 
is a great way to sort of build on the momentum that we've had throughout this week with Open being sort of very much centre stage and uh, we've got some great Open um, champions to talk to us next. I'm very much looking forward to listening to Catherine and Viv as well. So um, Catherine, I'm going to move to the first of your slides and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you so much. I, uh, thanks to everyone who's, uh, who's tuned in here. Uh, delighted to see you all and thank you to Lorna um, and everyone on the conference team for inviting me uh, to keynote at the conference. I'm really looking forward to it. That was a great introduction, Lorna. Um, I often have some difficulties here where my video competes with my audio, so um, I just wanted to put the video on here at the start and I'm going to turn it off so that the audio isn't compromised. I'll turn it on again for the Q&A. Um, and hopefully we can use it then. So sorry about that. Um, to be honest, um, I'm hoping that the keynote uh, is going to be as participatory as possible uh, in line with the themes of the conference, of course. Um, and by participatory, I mean for those at the conference and those who might be participating virtually. So to that end, I um, the title of the keynote, and I wanted to start thinking about the keynote in terms of questions, um, and I blogged that question a little earlier this week, and it was this. Um, if open is the answer, what is the question? Um, a little bit awkward, as, as some people uh, comment, commented to me. Um, my short blog post about the question, as well as um, about 15 uh, different comments and store five of the tweets um, are there at katherinecronin.wordpress.com. The provenance of the question, I suppose, was the observation that um, it is probably possibly something that's been preoccupying me for a bit. The observation that people arrive at openness, at open education, we are an OEP from a number of different places, and sometimes those can be very different. So, as I know, Viv is going to talk about um, in her piece this afternoon, uh, that can be maybe a focus on providing uh, free textbooks for students. That can be a focus um, on OER uh, itself perhaps focus on pedagogy, open pedagogy, or people talking about their core values of openness, openness as maybe a political stance. So as open practitioners, you know, we gather around our kind of metaphorical campfires or tables and we talk about openness, but we sometimes have difficulties because of those different underlying assumptions and motives. So really that's what, that's what I was getting at with that question. And um, I'm grateful to all the people who um, who jumped into the conversation during the week. Um, I have a couple of slides which really kind of paraphrase and cluster some of um, the contributions that are from people. Now, I don't have citations on these slides, but the citations are in my blog post. Um, the first cluster was around um, resources and OER, um, as you might expect, but not just textbooks. Um, that I did arise, but also I think this, the second item there in that first bubble is from Lorna um, about um, educational and cultural heritage resources. And you know, Lorna just describes so beautifully how that's going to be a focus of the conference, which I think is going to be a real strength of the conference. The second cluster is around personal practice. So a number of people contributed from their vantage points as, as learners, as researchers, as reflective educators. Um, that you know that their question to which open is the answer is you know how can I um, do learn share make reflect collaborate you know more and better um, more or less um, and there was an awful lot of discussion around those things the third cluster was um, how can I teach students and support staff better so those of us who you know who are involved in those enterprises so a lot about digital capability digital identity empowering learners. Um, and of course, many of these are integrated. No, no, no one. Um, I'm not suggesting that someone is in one cluster or the other, but um, these are definite um, clusters that may or may not apply um, to different individuals. Um, another cluster was really around the ethical and political aspects of openness. So, uh, you know, how can I serve the democratic purpose of knowledge construction? You know, um, my colleague Simon Warren contributed that. Um, people who are concerned with the question of education as a public good. Um, so there were a number of contributions around this. And then there were, uh, you know, some, some rhetorical and philosophical questions in response, which I loved. Um, you know, 
to what does open refer when, I, when we frame that question and why not open? I think that was Sheila McNeil's question. Um, you know, why do we have to justify openness? You know, which perhaps the question should be why not open? Um, and Sheila also, I think, brought up the point of um, that you, know, you might ascribe to all of these questions, um, but we can't assume that people do. So I think that's, that, that was my point. Um, one framework which has been really useful for me um, in discussions around openness what is looking at the different definitions or interpretations, I suppose, of openness and kind of, um, you know, this is based, this is not just my work, this is based on you know, work by many people and I'm sure we all um, use similar frameworks. This is, just happens to be one that I use. Um, and by the way, I should mention that many of many of the points that I'm referring to here were raised in the Excellence um, LTHE chat earlier this week, which uh, Leo is here. Um, this was facilitated by Javier Atenas and Leo Haveman. Um, so, for example, a question came up about what about the Open University? How does that fit into open education? And that is a question that often does come up. So, um, if I start at the bottom and, and open can refer to open admission, you know, not obviously just in UK, OU, but open universities globally. Um, and then some people use the word open to refer to resources which are simply free. Uh, and then obviously we refer to open um, open resources uh, as resources which are openly licensed or um, uh, available in the public domain. And then open educational practices. And that dotted line there is is the pivot point of very much of our conversations. You know, when people say something is open, we say, well, don't you mean free? You know, it's not openly licensed. So, um, you know, many of us in the open education community or who, perhaps I should say, those of us who consider ourselves open practitioners um, might say that only things that are kind of above that line are, are truly open. And another part of the framework is really looking at levels of openness. And again, from the bottom up, these are we're moving kind of from individual to institutional or, or organizational levels. So, you know, different different activities might be might prove to be on ramps for openness. So, a lot of digital literacies initiatives and open practice initiatives, like Campus Create, which is going on at our university at the moment, which was inspired by DS106, um, provides educators with the opportunity to just engage in fun, creative activities which might, as I said, encourage them to consider open practices um, in their work as researchers or educators. Um, and then, you know, further up the scale, we have open policy and open culture, um, like the example that Laura just gave around the University of Edinburgh and, and Greenwich and, and GCU. Um, but many of us are individuals who are working in institutions which do not have policies on open education. So I'm doing research at the moment, which is, exploring why and how individuals choose to use open educational practices um, when they're not, you know, in a culture of openness, um, which is probably most educators. So just a, a short snapshot of, of some of the research that I will share um, also in the keynote is based on my own study. I've, I've just finished today as one of the study. It's a qualitative study of academic staff practices. Um, as I said, the setting is one university which does not have any open educational policies. Um, the second phase of the research will involve um, working with staff and students together and um, exploring their engagements in open online spaces. But the first phase has just been um, speaking with academic staff. Um, just in, in, in a brief summary, some of the findings are that um, although sometimes we talk about OER leading to open educational practices, where you are looking at the practices of, of educators who are working in institutions without policies around openness. It's actually the reverse. Um, there's I'm um, finding emergent open practice based on maybe values or pedagogical choices that then may lead to OER. So in the case that I'm looking at, there's emergent open practice, a little use of um, formal OER. Um, another finding is just the primacy of identity, and by that I mean that you just don't have to dig too deeply before you hit questions of identity, um, which I'm sure many of you who work in open education are, are very familiar with. Um, and that's why I think some of the work that's done by um, Helen Beetham and others at GIS and the National Forum for Teaching and Learning Higher Education here in Ireland around um, identity and digital identity is so important. 
um, particularly with respect to openness. And there's this balancing act that um, I, I found myself speaking about with many, many, many people uh, in, in the course of my study, and that's this balancing act between privacy and openness. So we can share these wonderful stories of openness with educators, but if, if they have very clear ideas about how they want to maintain their own privacy, um, that can work against um, moving towards openness. And the different levels that um, I identify here are, are calling at the moment macro, meso, micro, and nano. And macro is just the first thing, you know, will I share? Um, you know, will I, will I share my research? Will I share my um, interim research findings, will I share, share my teaching ideas, my teaching practice, my teaching resources. But that's only the first question. The next level is who will I share as? So when um, a professional decides to embrace open practices, there's a very fundamental question about, you know, who will I share as? Will I share as my professional self? Will I integrate my personal and professional selves and identities? And how will I do that? Um, another level is who will I share with, and by that I don't just mean who's in my networks and um, you know, how will I how will I um, use different settings um, so that I can choose who I share with, but um, how will I signal my presence to various people? How can, confident am I in doing that? And the nano level is is very interesting, and I'm sure all, all of us open practitioners will relate to um, that moment before you press you know send or post or tweet. You say, will I share this, you know, this resource or this, this idea? And as one of the participants in my study said, um, you know, it's a lot of work for one tweet. So I think, you know, certainly the, the overall um, conclusion of, of my study at, at this phase is that open practice is, is individual. So, you know, that harkening back to those first questions that I asked. Um, it's contextual. It very much depends on where we are located and what the culture is. Um, it's complex and it's negotiated continually. Sometimes on a you know on a minute by minute basis. So um, I'm hoping that you know collectively we might look at some of those um, issues at the conference. Um, again, this question is just the starting point, and um, you know I hope it can be a more collective ende endeavor. You know I'll mention my research, but that's just one one part of what I hope to explore. That's it. That's great, Catherine. Thank you so much. And um, I'm, I'm just sorry, I was in the middle of a tweet, <laughs> so taken by the words on your slide, and I'm trying to, I feel like I'm, I'm on constant overload this week. <laughs> There's so much going on. I need to find a darkened room at the end of the day and sit down and think about so much stuff, because so many things have been shared, and it's all so exciting. So. Thank you all very much. If you've got questions, do pop them in the chat for Catherine and um, let's discuss them. I, I, I was particularly grasped by your comment about practitioners, um, that we, we often do find ourselves sort of stuck between policies and um, institutional ways of doing things and then how do I decide who I am and, and what I share and where I share it. This is something I've been grappling with for ages. So I'm really pleased to hear that um, OER16 may have some of those conversations and help us find our way through. Um, so great to great to have that uh, knowledge that that conversation is going to be going on and uh, I certainly hope to be uh, contributing to it as well. Um, I'm just looking, taking a quick look back, Francis, have you got any particular questions you'd like us to come back to? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, no, the, yeah. I, I looked carefully and there weren't any questions, just lots of comments, but I can make my last comment into a question as, uh, as I've got the microphone. Um, I, I loved your, your, that last slide where you talked about how we make decisions to share and, um, and, and the different sorts of decisions we're making. And as you know, something I've been thinking about is the, the, the conditions that pertain at the time we make the decision to share can change in the future. So sharing just isn't just a one-off mm. thing. It's it's something that might last for a, a longer time. And I just wondered what you thought about that, Catherine. Yeah, that, that's fascinating, Francis. And or, you know, I'm in, I've been enjoying our discussions about this. Um, yeah, I suppose um, quite often what's reflected back to me is is people asking me, well, do you use 
such and such a tool or not, and realizing pretty quickly that that doesn't really tell us very much. That, that as you say, it's contextual. You know, where we're located, what's going on in our lives, um, what's going on at this minute. Even just what you said, Teresa, about feeling overwhelmed this week. You know, sometimes that can be part of the context um, in which people decide whether or not to um, to be more or less open. You know, at a particular moment. So. You know, a number of the, of, the, of the educators that I spoke with in my study said, you know, I understand all the value of openness and everything, but I'm just overwhelmed. Um, you know, I'm teaching more and more students all the time, um, and I'm having difficulty, um, you know, just keeping up with, with what I have to do. And I think, oh, that's really wonderful, but I don't have time to do that. So, you know, that is our challenge um, in, in, in engaging with other professionals around openness and its possibilities and also its limitations. Yes, it's, it's one that I've been struggling with actually just recently because I'm very aware that as I have conversations with practitioners around things like um, uh, photos and attribution, um, that it, it's just another complication. Um, mm -hmm. And it needs to become so second nature or actually first nature so, that, so we start with open and then pull it back in. I, I tend to find myself, I work the other way around now, so I publish the resources that I've made and then bring them back in to my course or my students rather than going the other way around. I, I don't know if that, it seems to help things for me. Um, but we need to find ways of making things um, yes. Not another um, burden, just, not increasing the burden on some practitioners. Sorry. Yes, I agree completely. And I think Francis is, is writing recently some very interesting things about disconnection and connection. And you might want to say more, Francis. But you know, I think that's vitally important for us as, as practitioners that we don't seem to be advocates who don't recognize you know, the other side. And I think sometimes. We can, we can be seen as champions and cheerleaders, and a critical approach is so important. And I think people will listen, you know, will be more likely to listen to us if, we, if we're willing to talk about the, more, the complexities of openness rather than um, being simply champions or cheerleaders. Well, it's, it's great to have that. It's already I feel, I feel um, less anxious. <laughs> <laughs> because I've had some feedback and, and people saying, yeah, we've got to think about these things and, and that helps. That's that's huge and, you know, I'm, I hope everybody takes sort of comfort from being part of a, 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 the open community in that area that we can actually support each other through these tricky decision-making processes. Um, Francis, is there anything else you want to, or if anybody wants to grab the mic, you're very welcome to grab the mic if you've got questions for um, Catherine, or indeed for Lorna. We didn't stop and have a chat about um, OER 16, so if there's anything you want to come back on uh, there as well before we move on. If I can just briefly chip in there as well, if people do think of questions or comments after the webinar finishes, then do please feel free to um, just post them on Twitter or even just email any of us directly. I just was thinking about something while you were all speaking there. And um, I mean, I think that um, this is something that I think is done well in the OER community, but it's very difficult to resist some time um, preaching about about openness, you know. So part of acknowledging that people find it complex um, is is thinking about how you can address it with them. And I'd just like to point you to some practice of some ex-colleagues of mine at Salford, and I know this sort of thing happens elsewhere, but they're nurses, and when they first came across social media, they were quite preoccupied with the fear of how it, how it could all go horribly wrong. So what they've done is they model um, curation activities, so the, the lecturers support students taking a week at a time um, moderating a hashtag and I think those sorts of modeling um, activities are really valuable and I'm hoping to watch out for those at OER 16. Absolutely, 
absolutely, Francis. That's really helpful. I think the, the modelling is very much part of part of it. These things tend to be incremental. So if you s see one idea and you, you see it in action for a colleague and it works, you're far more likely to give it a try. Great. Thank you. Well, we're going to move on to our final part of um, today's webinar, and that's Viv, who's going to be talking to us about a new dawn for UK OER. And I, I know you've been travelling extensively, Viv, so I'm looking forward to hearing your news from abroad as well. <laughs> Was that expensively or extensively? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know about the expensive. Extensively. <laughs> no, I feel awfully privileged and really um, all of these types of travels are drawing on my the last remnants of my National Teacher Fellow funding which as uh, I don't know if you know much about the higher education teacher in excellence scheme there um, that's sadly being delayed this year but um, if you get um, to be awarded a fellow you've got a pot of £10,000 and boy that's been a lifeline really that has funded every conference, every bit of travel and really everything I've done over the last three years and um, I'm just at a bit of a loss to know what I'm going to do without it but yeah so I've been very lucky recently um, I went over to an OER meeting, ha, huh, it's a hard life, it was in New Orleans uh, which you can imagine for me was uh, was just an absolute bind and uh, last year also we went to the OER conference in Vancouver and I, I just want to sort of make some comparisons between where I think OER is in the UK and you know what's happening in other parts of the world and I think really what's fired me up this week um, which has been a bit of a surprise I've always enjoyed Open Education Week and there's lots of great stuff but I think the the conversation this year and the discussion around it through these three webinars has been absolutely exceptional and it's it's just driving me mad now and Catherine started it off with her question you know um, if opens the answer what's the question and that's been keeping me awake for most nights so I, I've just drawn some ideas together really um, just to hopefully feed into further debates I see I can forward my slides I'm trying to make sense of it all um, and these aren't my observations but I mean I did agree um, with the comments from audiences from the event earlier in the year and the open ed from last year there is a real monopolization of the open agenda and field in the US and Canada by the textbooks which in itself is a great thing but there's a real concern that over there they're losing the diversity and what about the little projects and the case studies and the small resources and just that culture of sharing there seems to be quite a seismic deviation and tangent from the past there now um, in a way I can see that that's great because it's been a really important political lever and you can't dispute the massive strides that people in the US and Canada have taken there's an affordable textbook act there's an open education advisor in the White House you know it's really ingrained in policy and state policy um, all over the US now which, which is really tremendous so it kind of gives me a clue to perhaps what we should be thinking about in the UK because I'm always thinking where do we go next um, is, is that relevant for us but I think the, the bit that concerns me that comes along with that is the whole narrative around the importance of adoption I don't see any reference to open practice or changing cultures all the lovely things that Catherine and Lauren have just talked about um, it's all adoption 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 and I think they're losing something and I, I've come away thinking as a UK community there is so much they could be learning from us and it would be good in some way to try and encourage all those UK OER projects to reflect back and share evidence of, of where they've come from um, and to feed that back into these U US conferences because the UK representation is very small there now. Um, so they're my reflections from the recent US and Canadian conferences I've been to and it just leaves me thinking and answering Catherine's question really where next for us in the UK um, and I, I was quite fired up also by the discussion on Monday and Joseph's contributions in that really our, 
our sort of grim reality in England, it has to be said, is, is pretty pretty grim, isn't it? Um, there's no advocacy at any sort of senior strategic level of OER. We've got an awful lot to learn from Scotland, of course, and Wales, who are leaping ahead. And I think us in England feel a bit, a bit jaded by that. It's like, we want to be doing this stuff too. Um, and not only that, you know, you know, students are, you know, not reaping the benefits of, of what we should be aspiring to do here. So some of Joseph's comments on the Monday webinar were, were really quite thought provoking. I think she reflected also that one of our strengths is our diversity, isn't it? From courses to MOOCs to badges to practice, you know, we, we really cover such a range of openness in terms of the activities and cultures that Catherine's just talked about. But I think in a way, because it is so dispersed, you know, what's pulling it forward? Um, and also, as she commented, we, we're in danger of being ignored if we can't create some arguments to put forward. And it's funny, the comments just now about, you know, how to create arguments and so what we do. I was, I was, um, I've got a new head of department and she said, oh, what's this open thing? Why should we be doing this? And I had to talk for quite some time before she finally said, oh, I get it. You know, and I, I think we become so entrenched in working in this way, we forget what some of those sort of more strategic arguments are. I could do being a lot better at that. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting thing for me. Um, there's also writing from last year, people at Audrey Waters, you know, opens diversified in other ways. Uh, people are slapping open on things and thinking that's it, that's good enough. But I think we're losing, losing some of that original definition of open really meaning a license, technology, accessibility. Um, and it's, it's kind of taken lots of other dimensions. Um, I think the open data um, community is really interesting because as my limited understanding of it is it's really difficult to use open licenses in that sense because you're having to license and attribute individual data points rather than data sets. So I think data is going to maybe take open in a bit of a, a new direction for us. So uh, yeah, I'm just left thinking this week really, what next for us and how do we move forward? There's a rather grumpy looking build up there. Um, so maybe there's a few things that we could do. So um, there's a Hewlett funded initiative at the moment to create a global world map. Um, it's quite data intensive in putting stuff to this map, but and Rob Farrow and myself are kind of pushing that out on Twitter and through the email lists at the moment. You can simply um, register and add a project, you can register and add a publication. So it's just gathering assets really. And I think that could be really good for us because I, th I think with a little bit of effort we could cover that map with total awesomeness and, and all the stuff that's going on. And, and, and you know, if we can gather reasonable quality data, that's going to be quite a powerful data set for us. So um, do look out for OE World Map. Tweets. I think there's a webinar for today, and uh, do look at Rob Farrow from the Open University for some of the stuff he's doing. So that's that's um, all compiled and led by Jan Newman, who's over in in Germany. Jan, Jan's really cool. Um, so that's one thing we can do. I think really just to what can we do to encourage people to keep publishing, keep writing, keep that evidence coming? You know, there's still very little reflection and. Um, articles that have actually looked back over those UK OER projects. You know, there was over 85 probably encompassing all UK universities and many colleges. You know, that volume of work w was massive. Um, and I just wish someone like JISC could just give us a little bit of money for some case studies just to keep drawing some of that together because that's really powerful too. Um, just a little plug for a project that Catherine and I pulled together for ALT last year really updating um, information for anyone wanting to go open and trying to reach out to new practitioners who might want to get started or people who want to enhance the practice. And that, that little wick is quite good actually. It's a useful resource and we keep adding to it. So do, do join in if you find any nice bits of information that you, you know, you're free to share on there. Um, so really, I'm, I'm still looking for what the question is in all of this. You know, what is our question? It, to enable us to really forge forward, draw things together in the UK, and who is it 
that we ask. And I'd be more than happy on behalf of the Alt Open Ed SIG to pull ideas together and think, uh, you know, what is it we can do to move forward even more amazingly um, as a group. And I think really that's all I was going to say. So questions, comments would be great. So I haven't got any red wellies to show you. Um, if I did, I'd expect my dog would eat them. But uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Viv. I don't think red wellies are actually sort of compulsory. <laughs> but uh, it's a nice thought. Get your red wellies on for Edinburgh. <laughs> Um, what I'm really interested in is the, the difference that you've highlighted between the, the way um, the, the US and perhaps Europe and the UK are, are going and, and the importance of us learning from each other. Oh, thank you, Catherine. That's really reassuring. <laughs> thank you for that comment. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm really, I'm really grateful for you sharing those insights because you know we tend to sort of focus on our context, and it's great to pull these things together. And, and maybe, maybe there isn't just one question we're looking for here. I kind of feel as though lots of questions are going to bubble up if we're having the conversations and getting down to the nitty gritty um, about you know what exactly do we mean and why, um, and and how does that affect things. So you know, I, th I think we've really got those great opportunities and Open Ed Week has been a good way of focusing our minds on those opportunities, but there's lots of work to be done and I'm sure a lot of it will happen over OER 16 when people are in the same place and talking, that, that always helps. Um, so I'm just going to come back to Francis and see because I know Francis has been checking on, on uh, comments and questions. We, we don't have a huge... Uh, vast room of number of people in here today unfortunately but the recording obviously will reach lots more people so if people um, are listening on the recording the uh, same rules apply do ask do still ask your questions do use these hashtags we've been putting out there so the OER 16 hashtag and um, Lorna provided information about how to contact her for, for queries and questions in the chat there and of course the um, open ed SIG hashtag as well. Um, we're still very much in beta mode, but we're still moving gradually towards, um, within the Open Ed SIG, um, a, a community space. And um, I'll just make sure that, so from the Open Ed SIG main page, main landing page here that I'll just tweet out, just put in the chat for you, you'll now see that um, uh, under Get Involved, you've got a link to the community space. Now, it's still very much in beta. We haven't been able to finish everything we wanted to be able to finish, but the first blog post is up there. We, we want to put a machine-readable CC BY license on the blog, um, and it will be, the, that community space will be open to not just everybody who's um, obviously in the alt SIG, but anybody who's interested in open education. Um, and so there is a mechanism that's being put into place at the moment to make sure that uh, whether you're a member of alt or not, you can access the, alt, the open ed community. And uh, there'll be more on that uh, link there, that main page, as that becomes live and uh, becomes available. So we want to take these ideas and, and um, build on them, have these discussions in uh, forums and make sure that we can um, very uh, hopefully, <laughs> helpfully draw these things together um, and mediate these communications so that we can um, get a picture of where people are. Um, so if anybody has any uh, further questions or queries or, or contributions, please grab a mic and speak to us. Or pop them in the text chat, if you'd rather not. Can I dive in there, actually, Teresa? Um, Absolutely. I just wanted to um, pick up on the point that um, Viv made. I think you're absolutely right, Viv. I think there is a sort of um, there's a depth of open practice here in the UK, which I think is quite different from the way openness is going in the US. Um, but I, yeah, I think there are there are things to be learned on both sides, perhaps. And uh, one of the things that I've certainly seen is that um, open practice is still there in the UK and I think we can still see the impact of the, um, the old UK OER programme 
I know a lot of us here were involved in that, and I think we've carried that practice through with us. But at the same time, um, there has been a real lack of traction in trying to promote open policy at the higher level. Um, and some of you will be aware of the Open Scotland initiative that um, some of us here have been involved in. Um, and although we have tried very, very hard to engage the Scottish Government in the hope that they will actually have some kind of policy on open education similar to open access, we've actually we've had no success in engaging them at all. Um, we do tend to get sort of like encouraging noises back from them when we raise awareness of the Scottish Open Education Declaration, but we haven't managed to get any further than that. So I think there is there are still blockages at that at that higher level, um, but it is very encouraging to see um, more and more universities certainly developing their own open education policies, which at least gives some indication that at senior management level in higher education there is growing awareness. Um, of the benefits of open education and open education practice, um, and hopefully we can, you know, that will filter out into other sectors. I mean, clearly the college sector has undergone enormous turmoil um, over the last few years, but hopefully now that that settles down, openness can come back onto the agenda there. Uh, but really, I think. Our colleagues in America are very good at lobbying at government level. They're very successful there. I think that's something we're less good at here. I don't think lobbying works the same way. Um, so I, I certainly don't have the answers, but um, I think there is a big question about how do we get um, government ministers interested and aware of the benefits of open education. Yes, yes, you're very right. It, it, you know, it, it's kind of, it's there but not there, isn't it? It's one of these uh, very sort of um, uh, mysterious phenomena that turns up in um, in policy documents and, uh, you know, we were looking at metadata um, on policy documents recently for the word um, sustainable. And, and it, it, open in the same way as the sustainable, that we don't seem to actually have clear definitions. Um, so, you know, I think I think the discussions that were going on in the chat this week around um, defining what we mean and the discussions we have to meet have to have there um, are, are important discussions because every time a, a, some something is put forward to policymakers, they are finding it difficult to actually um, equate what we're saying to to any clear action. Um, and I'm particularly fond of the point that um, was made earlier about little OER and the trouble with little OER um, uh, disappearing off the um, agenda is that actually it's little OER that actually infuse people about getting involved in open practice. Um, it's the fact that you might take, you know, contribute something to open source code, or you might be able to um, remix a collection of resources to make something that is uh, very specific to your context and uh, and reusable. Um, I, I think it's important that we raise the profile of little OER as well. So that's my soapbox. <laughs> Anyone else going to dive in? Yeah, I think, oh, sorry, am I going over long enough? But anyway, I should crash on. I, I, mean, I think that's what we always tried when UKR was, was going all those years ago, was actually how can we link it to university strategy and policy? And I, I think we've hit the nail on the head this week with, with some ways forward. One is, you know, if, if, you're, if you're aspiring to be open, you're aspiring to generate things that are sustainable. I mean, on Wednesday, we saw the relationship between open and accessibility, which I think is going to become ever more relevant. And, we, you know, we're talking about, you know, ed education on a sort of global scale also. So I think those three areas, open education, is the foundation that sort of underpins all of that. So if we could just sort of frame the arguments um, in those three directions, that might be one way to go. I might think about that. I'd be very grateful to have additional brain power going on these on these things. I think our collective brain power could help. <laughs> Thanks very much, Viv. Connecting practice and policy, yes, and it, and it's something that is very rarely done very well. Connecting practice and policy. 
in the same way as sort of theory and practice often doesn't sort of join up. Yeah, I have no idea where we can get a soapbox there. <laughs> um, we, we've just had a couple of new people join us. So I'm sorry, but we are coming to the end of our webinar. We have just only a few minutes left. Um, can, can I, can I jump in with one very last please question? Do, please do. Oh, it's actually a question for Viv. Um, Viv, is there such a strong concept of open education practice in the US at the moment? I think I think there might be, but it's it's difficult to surface because you know people that get the funding to go to the conferences are people working on sort of high impact projects. So I must say, in the last two events I've been to, um, 2015 and this year, there were practically almost without exception, no presentations and um, those sort of case studies from colleges or departments that had changed or adopted open practices, there, there's none of it and it's it's all about the textbook um, story, narrative, which I can understand that's where the funding is and that's been the political lever. So it might be there but we're just not seeing it. Thanks, I did, I did wonder if that was the case, thanks. Yes, apologies, Caroline, you've not been able to get in earlier, but uh, hopefully once the recording is up, you'll be able to uh, catch everything. Um, just a reminder that I'm just going to move to the final slide here. Just a reminder that um, the text chat can be saved. So if you come up to the top left and go to tools, uh, sorry, no, file and save, you can um, save the entire chat or indeed the whiteboard to your desktop if you uh, wish to do so. And yes, Catherine, yet again, the time flies by, doesn't it? But it's great to actually um, be in, a, even if it's a virtual room, um, with all of you, with Lorna and Viv and Catherine and Leo and Francis, you're all people who inhabit my world um, uh, very much virtually. So <laughs> um, I have, we haven't managed to make it into one physical room yet, but it's lovely to have uh, to have you all here together. And if anybody has any further questions, do just pop them in the text chat with a Q or um, or grab a mic and speak to us while we've got everybody here, and Sheila as well, while we've got everybody here, we've got lots of uh, brain power to engage. Thank you, Celeste. Thank you for that feedback. And, and yes, let's have some applause for our presenters today. It's been a very busy, very tiring week, and it's great to feel that we've gone out on a high as well um, with some more things for us to think about and, and those things will eventually sort of um, help to uh, bring together exactly what we need to focus on. I'm sure these discussions will, will help a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. And looking forward to those of you who can actually attend OER 16, looking forward to uh, seeing the ripples of that online personally. And thank you all very much for coming today. And thank you, um, Catherine, Lorna, Viv, uh, for your contributions. And thank you, Teresa, for being a wonderful moderator. Thank you all. <laughs> thanks, Catherine. Yes, thanks, Teresa. <laughs> Well, thanks for all your hard work. I know it's been a very long week for you, but it's great to hear it's been such a successful week. Um, and uh, like I say, we'll look forward to, to seeing you virtually as OER 16. So thanks again. Thank you. You're all very welcome. Take care. And uh, I hope to see you on the Open Ed Seed community very soon. <laughs>